going way back here to the beginning of uh, the 20th century, people uh, like Marie Curie had discovered radioactivity, and people were getting, uh, the experimenters were busy studying the, you know, what, what is this radioactivity? And, um, and they were beginning to make progress in, you know, in finding different categories of radiation and, um, and uh, you know, basically started to figure things out. So uh, say the first radiation that was found was um, a high energy helium nuclei coming out of uranium. And since it was the first, they called that the alpha particle. And uh, then later on, they found that there was another type of particle that was going a little bit deeper into their experiment. It could pass through more layers of film or whatever it was that they were using. And um, that one they called the uh, beta particle. It turns out that that's a, uh, an electron. So, so uh, for a long time, um, we, you know, we had two names for electrons. Uh, depending on what your field of study was, you might call it an electron, or you might call it a beta particle. And uh, then uh, further on, we had another discovery, even more penetrating particles, and those were called gamma particles, and it turned out eventually that those were photons, very, very high energy photons. So uh, the neutrino was quote unquote invented by uh, Wolfgang Pauli, who was studying the experimental results from looking at things like neutrons or in particular tritium uh, decaying into, uh, in the case of, of a neutron, it could decay into a proton and an electron. And in the case of the, you know, that, that's just one possible decay. Okay, so, so we're going to focus, uh, I'm going to focus this explanation on, um, on tritium uh, because it's still relatively simple. It's not as simple as just a bare neutron, but it's more realistic to do. In those days, uh, regular you know, bare neutrons were not available for experimenters, but tritium was available. And so, okay, so first of all, what is tritium? So we have... Uh, this, uh, this would represent hydrogen. A hydrogen atom has a proton and a single electron, which you could visualize as orbiting around it, or the way they pictured it here, it looks like a sort of smeared cloud of electric charge around the proton. It has a funny name here. I've never even heard this before. Proteum, okay. So I learned something preparing for this talk. Proteum. Um, and then we have uh, what's maybe commonly known as heavy hydrogen, um, deuterium, and it gets used in making heavy water. And so regular water is H2O. Um, heavy water would be a deuterium, two deuterium uh, atoms, and then an oxygen. Sometimes it's written D2O. Um, okay, and then we have uh, a version of the hydrogen atom which has, uh, which we call tritium. And so, okay, so the, the tritium has uh, three nucleons, right? The tri makes sense. Uh, it's a proton and two neutrons. The deuterium had two nucleons and um, the, the proton and the neutron. Now, the tritium uh, atom is radioactive, but it has a pretty long half-life, 12.3 years. So it's a convenient material to use. Um, it, it'll hang, you, know, you make your tritium, and you, you've got it you know, for like a decade or so at least. So, okay, that's nice. And uh, okay, so the uh, so I, this is uh, what you might think a beta decay for tritium would look like. You have your two neutrons and a proton. That's your tritium. And uh, it turns, one of those neutrons turns into a proton. So it looks like it's the top one here. This top neutron, in the picture anyway, has turned into a proton and uh, emitted a, uh, uh, an electron. 
This picture um, was written by uh, Enrico Fermi. Uh, I have his, one of his old books. And uh, so that's why this sort of has an old style to it, including the figure and so on. All right, so, um, so let's take a look at how much, um, in a little more detail. So first of all, how much energy should you get when the tritium decays into this thing? Oh, I, I forgot to say, but uh, this is helium, right? Um, uh, two protons means you're going to have two electrons. Uh, uh, any atom that has two protons and two electrons is going to be helium. The most common, uh, that's you. Um, I see, that's good. What okay. kind of annotate, because they can't see the Oh, they, yeah, right, okay. Um, all right, well, thank you for doing that. Okay. I, I don't think I'd be able to do a good job on the mouse and talk at the same time. Um, so, okay, so this is a, one of the isotopes of helium. The, the most common one, the one that we have all of, you know, in our party balloons is helium-4. That would be two protons and two neutrons. But this is uh, helium-3. Okay, that's not an important thing. Um, and then you get your uh, your your electron coming out. Uh, notice that this equation, right? Um, the charge is balanced. Right? So so when we talk about the stuff in this worksheet or, or paper anyway, uh, I'm going to be focusing on balancing equations. And um, so so we have one positive charge here, the proton two positive charges here, but then the electron is one negative charge. So we get two, take away one, and so we have a net charge of one on the right-hand side, just like we had a net charge of one on the left-hand side. Okay, so that, that right there, if you, can, if you can hold on to that idea, that the charge on the left has to equal the charge on the right, good for you, that, that's one little hurdle taken care of. Okay, another thing, that has to happen is uh, the energy on the left side and the right hand side should be conserved. Now in order for this type of uh, reaction to happen, it's, uh, it's more or less necessary for the potential energy on the left, of the left atom, on the left nucleus, to be higher than the potential energy of the stuff on the right-hand side. So this, this is the idea that you're familiar with in chemistry, right? If you happen to have hydrogen atoms and oxygen atoms, there's quite a bit of chemical potential energy locked up in that. And you mix them and there's a spark and boom, that energy is released. You produced water, H2O, and, and quite a bit of heat. So, so what I'm saying is that for chemical reactions to go, you need a higher potential energy to start with than what you end with. Chemistry, though, is a little subtle. You, know, you might catch a slight mistake in what I'm saying when you, once, you take, once you take into consideration entropy, then weird things happen. But forget about entropy for now. Okay? We'll just go with that. Um, all right, so, so the question is, how much energy do you have? And that can be uh, determined by weighing or, or finding somehow the mass of your, uh, your beginning particle, your, your tritium nucleus, and comparing that to the mass of your uh, helium nucleus uh, plus the mass of your electron. And, um, and so you, once you get that, that uh, you get this information, the difference between, you basically, the mass of the stuff on the left minus the, step, the mass of the stuff on the right, that's going to determine the energy available through Einstein's ridiculously famous formula, E equals mc squared. So, uh, so you take, here, it, it's, it's m, but really what we want is the change in m, the, the beginning 
mass minus the final masses, the final combined mass. And that multiplied by this e double i squared tells you how much energy will come out. All right. Now, the thing is that uh, when they studied this, they knew the masses. They could predict how much energy these things would have. Um, this thing should come out with essentially all of the energy, the mc squared of energy. This thing will, will take it steal away a little bit of energy, but it's very massive, and so it's only a little bit. Um, we'll get into that a little later, why it's only a little bit. The thing is that they knew how much energy the electron should have when it came out. It should be a definite amount. These masses are very stable numbers, right? You, you don't see trigium change mass. You don't see electrons change mass, no. And yet, what they got was a smear of energies. The, there was, it seemed like the, the, the beta particle, the electron, was getting a, a kind of a semi-random amount of energy. And that drove the physics people crazy. So, okay, I have here uh, an analogy um, for beta decay. How am I doing? So, um, this cannon here represents the tritium atom. And, uh, and the, uh, the cannonball inside um, is going to be the, the electron coming out. And the tritium atom has potential energy that you could think of that as being the energy of the gunpowder. The cannon fires, and the gun, you know, if it's an actual cannonball, it's going to come out with a pretty much uh, a, a predictable amount of, of energy and, and velocity and so on. If I were to uh, do a, um, an experiment with an old cannon, an antique cannon, you might get data that looks like this. Um, this is called a histogram in physics. It has different names, like a frequency distribution and so on. In physics, we call it a histogram. And the vertical axis is a, a count of how many experiments you've done. And the horizontal axis is the result you get. I mean, it's in ranges. So, um, so yeah, so for example, it, it, you know, this is, of course, I'm waving my hands here. I didn't do this experiment, but still, you might get results that look like this. You might find, if you do 10, uh, 10 firings of the cannon, that five of them are in the range of, the, the energy of the cannonball might be in the range of 950 to 1050 joules. And then, you know, maybe somebody put a little too much gunpowder, you get a little extra energy sometimes. Maybe the gunpowder got a little wet and get a little less energy sometimes and so on. But still, you would you get a, a, a peak here. You would expect a peak of um, you know, the, the sort of the standard energy for the cannonball. And this is something that you could easily calculate. All right. And so a similar, now I'm going to the actual uh, uh, beta decay of tritium here. So, and, and I'm, I'm, kind of, I'm going with the, the notes um, uh, from uh, Enrico Fermi way back. He, he was teaching this to his students, and um, one of the pleasures of, of getting ready for this talk was to open up these old notes, you know, from the 1940s. And he was a really good teacher. His notes are terrific. Um, so I learned something. Okay. So you, you do something with your uh, tritium atom and you measure the electrons, and this is what they expected. They, you see the E equals mc squared thing? Uh, that told them that the energy available should be th uh, close, uh, 2.98, well, practically three, times 10 to the negative 15 joules. So the electron should come out with that much energy. This is what they expected to see. And then they do the experiment, and, and no, that's not what they got. They got a range of results 
And the highest energy that they got was 3 times 10 to the negative 15. But, but that, you know, that this, so the, at least something is sort of halfway right. You know, the upper end is correct. But why did they get this range of, of different um, energies for the particles coming out? And uh, yeah, okay, so it's a big mystery. Can I ask a question there? So the, the highest energy they got was the 3 times 10 to the negative 15, but it was not the most common energy. Right, right. They were expecting that, they, they were not expecting any of this. They were expecting to see all of the betas coming out with this energy. And so, so it, it sh there, when they do the graph, the graph should have looked something like that. And, um, but that's not what happened. So how do you explain that? They were really stuck. Um, so Pauli, who is one of the stars of the 1930s physics community, um, sent this letter uh, to Enrico Fermi and, and all these other physicists, and in it he says something like, I have done something really bad. I have hypothesized a particle which cannot be detected. And, and you know, I, I teach this at the beginning of my classes, if you have a theory that cannot be confirmed or tested, it's not scientific. So, so Polly was, you know, he was really worried about this. But still, he hypothesized that the energy was being stolen, so to speak, by an invisible particle. So uh, I do try to kind of make this more concrete. Uh, I decided to go back to the gun analogy, and I've added a neutrino gun, all right? So the neutrino is the invisible particle. And uh, so before, you, you've got the uh, equals mc squared of energy, and, and then after that, you, you fire at the gun, and the neutrino gun and the regular gun fire at the same time. And so I have a little ghost here. And did you notice that the ghost mouth has a Greek letter mu? <laughs> mu that, that, that's the symbol of neutrino. Okay. All right, so the idea is that the ghost is coming out and um, sometimes he comes out slowly, sometimes he comes out fast. It's a random thing. How much energy uh, goes into the ghost and how much energy goes into the cannonball is, is randomly decided. It, it's, all, it's all a matter of chance. Um, and, and this works pretty well, right? You, you, you will get the cannonball having a random distribution Sometimes the ghost doesn't get any energy and the cannonball will get that maximum. Sometimes the ghost gets half of the energy, in that case the cannonball gets half and so on. There's one little thing missing in this picture and that is I have the neutrino gun pointing forward. And in real life, uh, the neutrino gun should be pointing in some random direction for every, every shot. So, um, but I, I couldn't figure out a good way to draw that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so now uh, we have this idea that Enrico Fermi takes seriously. And um, uh, I just want to say as an aside that uh, my teacher at the University of Arizona when I was getting my PhD. His name was Ted Bowen. And he, his teacher was Enrico Fermi. And Enrico Fermi had many, many students, so it's not, you know, it's not focused the glory on him. But, um, but still, um, I could see that Ted would really admire Enrico and Enrico Fermi. And, um, and, uh, and some of that teaching skill must have rubbed off on Ted was a very good teacher as well. Okay, so um, rather than calling it the ghost, Fermi called it the little neutral one, which uh, translated into Italian, I think, is uh, mu neutral. You know, so mu is for neutral, and 
Canada, or Utrecht, something, and then eat all these little ones. Okay, so uh, I took this again from uh, the, this is the notes, this is what it looks like. Um, and um, all right, so this is what he wrote. He has the tritium uh, becoming uh, helium three, and plus an electron, plus this mu symbol, mu symbol, which means neutrino. And uh, the, uh, the the maximum energy of the beta or the electron is the 0 0.019 MeV. So uh, yeah, so. I don't know if I said it already, but um, electron volts are a kind of energy unit, right? We're used to um, watt hours, or uh, in the physics class, we're used to joules. And uh, an electron volt is the energy that an electron gets if it falls uh, from one place to another. Like, let's say it's replaced with a one volt battery, and it falls that much. It's pushed by the electric field that would get that much energy, one electron volt of energy. An MeV, mega electron volt, is the energy the electron would get if the battery was a million volts. The electron goes from here to here. And so with a million volts, of course, it'll go, right? It'll have a lot of energy. Um, if you want a conversion factor, one electron volt is 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19. That number, 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19, you might recognize as the, uh, the charge of an electron in coulombs. Anyway, we, we don't want to spend too much time on conversions. We got more important things to take care of. Okay, so this this is the new picture, including the neutrino. And. Uh, Again, I got this straight out of the notes, out of the book by Enrico Fermi. This is what you get. You get a distribution of energies. Um, so, so each, you know, right, this maybe represents um, a thousand or a million experiments, each experiment being one beta decay. And where the line is high, that means it's the most probable. You get the most of the beta decays, the, have the electron having this much energy. Um, if you say you go here, well, it's now half as often that it happens. If you go down to here, it's very rare that it happens. And then if you're beyond energy at the max there, it never happens. Okay. And uh, so, um, oh, and then here I, I added this. The, the maximum energy you figure out by doing the final mass minus the initial mass. And um, yeah, okay. So um, some more examples. I, this um, this is a an actual uh, spectrum for tritium. There's a huge experiment going on in Germany where they're measuring this this spectrum with exquisite accuracy. And and so this is the uh, the spectrum that they're getting from uh, from tritium decays. Uh, the units here are in kilo electron volts. Um, so you can sort of divide by a thousand to have mega electron volts to be compatible with what we had before. But you can see the shape is the same, and this would be the maximum energy. And then um, there are many examples of beta decay of various elements, and you know, here's one uh, bismuth 210 radioactively decaying to polonium, and it has the same effect electron coming out, and it's sharing the energy with a neutrino that's coming out. All right. Okay. Uh, yeah. So you may notice that I'm sneaking in a slightly different notation here. Here's the neutrino, and I put a bar over it. Here is the neutrino, and I put a bar over it. So what's that? What's the bar for? So uh, it means anti. It's an anti-neutrino. Um, and 
so so what we're saying is that this myth oh, I'll go back I'm sorry <laughs> so what we're saying is that uh, tritium let's say will uh, radioactively decay beta decay into helium plus an electron plus a antineutrino and here the bismuth has decayed into uh, bromium a beta and an antineutrino okay so, so then what's all this anti business about um, all right so yeah before I explain I don't know if, all right okay so just hold on to that thought and Let's take a look at another example. So here is copper, uh, copper 64. Um, okay, this should be nickel. Uh, I got to make a change here. Uh, so we've got copper 64 radioactively decaying to nickel 64 plus an E plus and a regular neutrino. I did not write anti here. On the other hand, I did put an anti-electron. No, the positron. The positron, exactly. Yeah. So, so you can kind of see a pattern here. You've got to have an anti-something over here. It's either going to be the electron becoming an anti-electron or the neutrino being an anti-neutrino. All right. So there's a pattern here. So, yeah. We're going to get to this one. So what reactions are possible? You know, what's impossible? And, and uh, in order to determine that, um, you can apply various conservation laws. And if it breaks a conservation law, then it's impossible. If it doesn't, then it is possible. Although not all reactions, you know, just go. Uh, some of them can be, you know, very improbable or go very, very, very slowly. And, okay, so what do I mean by conservation law? I mean some aspect of the experiment, of the materials, let's say the tritium atoms or the bismuth atoms, uh, that have to stay the same before and after the, re the reaction, right? So, so let's go through what we have. So for example, the energy and matter before the reaction must equal the energy and the matter after the reaction. That's conservation of energy. The electric charge must before must equal the electric charge afterwards. Um, similarly, uh, momentum, the total momentum of your system before the reaction has to equal the uh, momentum after the reaction. And then uh, we're going to see similar laws, you know, conservation laws for quantum things called the baryon number, the lepton number, and, and then uh, angular momentum, although I'm actually not going to visit angular momentum. All right, so we have some examples here. So conservation of matter. So you know, that's pretty straightforward. I mean, chemis chemistry sees that all the time. Right? If you have burning of methane, um, you can check that the reaction makes sense, right? You want to have an equal number of carbons on the left and right side, hydrogens on the left and right side, and so on. Conservation of energy. So, um, so when you when you work this out, um, you'll, you know, and you check the amount of energy available and the chemicals and so on, you'll realize that energy has to come out of this reaction. And so, uh, what a chemist would write typically is CH4, the methane, plus the oxygen will go to carbon dioxide, plus water, plus energy. So now you've balanced the energy on both sides. Now, in chemistry, conservation of matter and conservation of energy are, are dealt with sort of separately. But in nuclear physics, um, Things, uh, because of, of the fact that you have incredibly high energies and very light particles that are going to be moving you know, near the speed of light, uh, a different approach is needed. It, this approach comes from special relativity. Um, 
And, and, and so in nuclear physics, the conservation of the matter and energy is sort of bundled together. So we don't really say you know, conservation of matter and then separately conservation of energy. Instead, it's both at the same time. Um, now, if you wanted to, you could take the approach of nuclear physics and relativity and so on, and um, it would be really you know, a pain in the rear end, but you could say, oh, yes, the uh, mass of these things is slightly more, uh, the, the, the methane mass plus the oxygen mass is slightly more than the CO2 and water, and they, you know, using E equals MC squared, you could say, oh, yeah, the, uh, that mass difference uh, matches up with the energy that you get out. So it's not impossible to do chemistry this way, but I, I, I wouldn't recommend it. Um, all right. So yet another, okay, let's look at conservation of momentum. Um, so momentum is mass times velocity. And um, so looking at the, my cannon example, my system is the cannon at the beginning uh, with the cannonball inside. Nothing is moving. So the mass is you know pretty big, right? It's a cannon and a cannonball. But the velocities are all zero. So my system has zero momentum to begin with. Then, the cannonball is fired out. The cannonball has a positive momentum. It's going to the right. If that's if we stopped there, we'd be in trouble because we're not we're violating conservation of momentum. We have to have the total momentum be zero. Right? That's what the law says. It started out at zero, it should still be zero. And in fact, it does end up working out because cannons always recoil to the left. And when you combine when you combine the momentum to the left of the cannon with the momentum to the right of the cannonball, it adds up to zero. The, the momentum cancel out. And, and so we see things like that happening in, uh, in beta decay. So for example, you might have um, the positron decay of a copper nucleus. I think that, that was my example from before. And uh, when they do this sort of thing, and they look you know, very carefully, these are hard experiments to do, um, they'll notice that um, the, the momenta are slightly imbalanced because the neutrino is stealing some of the momentum. And so, um, so here you have a total momentum of zero, and then here you have the nickel uh, product, the nickel nucleus, having momentum up and to the left. The positron is going up and to the right, so it has that momentum. And, and so, so, wow, if you have just those two, you're, you're breaking the law. You have an overall momentum upward. That's no good. Well, the problem is resolved by including the neutrino. So the neutrino is, has momentum down and to the left, and, and the problem is solved. physics here today. <laughs> I mean, I'm just, as I'm going along, I'm realizing I'm hitting you with a lot. Um, so uh, if you're holding on, uh, I'm happy. That's good. OK, uh, da, 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 da. what do I have here? I, I, I ran through the numbers. And so conservation of energy. Uh, so OK, I think I'm going to move on. Okay, so now let's look at conservation of electric charge. We, we kind of already touched on this. Um, I already told you that the electron is this tiny amount of electric charge. Now this number, 1.602 times 10 to the negative 11, is a bother to use. So rather we just say one electron charge and just use the number one for the electron. But, but the, the electron is negative, right? So we say that the charge of the electron, or charge number of the electron, is negative one. The 
positrons, right, the anti-electrodes are positive, we say they have a charge number of positive one. Neutrons and neutrinos have a charge of zero. Uh, there's such a thing as an antiproton, right? Regular protons have a charge of plus one. Antiprotons have a charge of negative one. And, um, and so, yeah, I'm just saying here at the bottom that this uh, conserves uh, charge conservation, right? And we, I think we already said it. Here you have a charge of one on the left. Here you have a charge of one and two for the two protons, minus one for the electron, and so one on the right. So charge is conserved before and after. The overall charge is one. Yeah. And yeah, then it's blocked by my screen here, but the anti-neutrino has a charge of zero. Oh, and I, okay, something interesting. Uh, in, um, in Fermi's notes, which he wrote in 1940, he didn't have the bar, right? I, this is straight out of his notes. There was no bar. And so I'm thinking, oh, what am I going to do? You know, it, it's crazy. I was aware of something, and I was kind of surprised. And then at the very end of his notes, there's like this little footnote that says, you know, there's been some discussion that maybe there's such a thing as an anti-neutrino. And so if that's the case, then I have to go and I have to modify things here and there in my notes. You know? So he was just sort of giving his students a heads up that there was this new knowledge coming along. And so I went ahead and I did. I put the, the bar over the neutrino. Uh, I noticed that there's a, a chat saying something. Is there a question? Uh, no, there's just some other students telling you which class they're here for. Oh, okay. I see. Um, okay, so now um, let's, um, let's take a quick look at what's on the piece of paper here. So all of these quantities that I've given you, they have to be conserved in reactions. So I've listed particles, proton, antiproton, neutron, antineutron, and so on. Uh, next to that I put the symbol, which you've kind of been seeing all along here. Then after that I put the charge, plus one, and oh, I found a mistake. Can you take your pencil and where it says antiproton, make that negative one. And, uh, and also, the, you know, okay, there's a bunch of mistakes, you see? All right, so the antiproton, the charge should be negative one. And also the baryon number should be negative one. So go ahead and, and fix that. The neutron seems to be okay. The antineutron, its baryon number, right, it's like the middle column, should be negative one. Maybe I'll find more mistakes as we go. All right, so we have uh, the charge number, the baryon number, the lepton number, and then the mass, which which is in uh, units of, of electron volts or mega electron volts. Okay. So, so now let's try this. Um, on your piece of paper, write the quantum numbers or these, these conserved numbers uh, on the left. So, so for example, so, so on the left, what should I write? For the uh, so we've got a proton and an antiproton annihilated, right? So so we have before and after. So before we have Q equals, all right, we have a plus one for the proton and a negative one for the antiproton. And so the total charge should add up. To zero. So hopefully you're writing this on your paper. And then afterwards, so after, we have uh, the, these are photons, I should have added this to my list. Photons have a charge of zero. So after that we have charge equals 
zero. Okay. Um, baryon numbers. The baryon number of a proton is positive one, and the baryon number of a antiproton is negative one. So they're going to add up to zero. The baryon number of the photon is zero. Um, okay. What about the mass? The mass before is uh, 938 MeV and for the proton. It's n uh, nine. 938 on the left plus 938 on the right. And I can't do this in my head. It's just, it's just you know, 18, uh, 1, 2, 3, uh, 7, 6. Not many, really don't forget it. And the EV, uh, I, that, that adds up to 1, 8, 7, 6, and the EV. Now, that one that 1,876 that can't just go poof, go away. We have to keep it. So so this that amount of energy is shared by the two gammas. By the gammas. And so we can say that the two gamma rays will each have uh, one uh, 938 MeV. So, so we now know that as long as we can, you know, as long as there's these gamma rays really do have uh, 938 MeV each, we're okay. The, the reaction makes sense. We balance the left and right sides. I have a question. Is yeah. it going to be split, evenly split? Does it, does it have to be? Because evenly split between the two gamma rays. It is. It, it is evenly split. And um, it, it's, it's beautiful to behold. Um, you'll see, in, in, in real life, you'll see two tracks going in exactly opposite directions. And, um, and it, it's very cool when that happens. Um, OK, so we have the conservation rules continuing here. Um, Varying number, let's see. Um, I'm going to try to speed things up a little bit. Um, let's take a look at this one here. The baryon number for the uh, tritium that we start with is 3. The baryon number for the helium-3, right, if there's three nucleons, is also 3. Right? So, um, so protons and neutrons have baryon numbers of 3. So it doesn't matter. That you know that it changed from a, pro, uh, a neutron to a proton. It's still a baryon number of three. Um, the lepton number uh, of these things is zero. Right? So this has a lepton number of zero. This one has a lepton number of zero as well. What is the lepton number of the electron? Look at the chart and somebody tell me what's the lepton number of the electron. Plus one, great. What's the lepton number of the antineutrino? Negative one. Whoa, plus one and negative one add up to zero. So we have zero lepton number on the left, zero lepton number on the right. Our equation is okay. Yeah, okay, we just did this. Okay, I can skip this slide because we just did it, actually. We just balanced the left time number. Keep going. Uh, all right, now, here's another thing that can happen. You can have a electron meet up with an anti-electron, and they will annihilate and produce two gamma rays. And and the, the thinking is the same. You have a lepton number of positive one and negative one. They add up to zero before. Afterwards, these photons, the gammas, the, the 
of photons and left on them is just zero, so you get zero. All right. Um, okay, so, and, and then the energy is conserved in the same, you know, the same process and so on. A uh, little notation thing. Um, usually people will write anti electron or positron as an E with a plus superscript, but occasionally you'll see uh, a bar over the E. It does happen once in a while. Uh, actually, I don't think, I never, I said I will use both, but in fact, I stayed away from E bar. Okay. Uh, momentum, okay, we're not going to worry about momentum. Um, we're also not going to worry, at least in these notes, we're not going to worry about uh, angular momentum. But, um, but in, you know, if you want to do detailed analysis, you have to pay attention to, to these things. All right, and there is the symbol with my mistakes. So um, well, I'll have to come back and fix my mistakes. All right, so now um, we already talked about the masses. So I'm going to move on beyond that. And all right, so, so here we have this hypothesis that Pauli proposed that Fermi um, is taking seriously. And, and you know, uh, Fermi, uh, by the way, he's the one who was behind the construction of the first nuclear reactor. So you know, he is a big shot, and um, he's also a, a terrific um, experimentalist and a, a pretty decent theorist. So if he, if he takes it seriously, he will pay attention. Um, he, he started to work on how hard would it be to actually detect neutrinos. And in his notes, he makes uh, this calculation a rough calculation, and he says every billion, every second, um, this huge number. Uh, actually, the, the business of going through your nose every second—that that's my math. Okay, so but I use the data from Fermi. A uh, hundred billion neutrinos are passing through us, through you know, through that much space every second coming from the sun, and and you know nothing happens. So clearly, neutrinos will go through things and not interact. Um, and uh, okay, what Fermi actually said was that a neutrino can cross the entire sun and, and not interact. Um, the way he put it was, it could go through with little probability of being absorbed. So these are particles that just go through things without interacting, and that makes them very, very hard to detect. So I'm gonna go through the business of just actually detecting neutrinos, and then time is running out, so, yeah. And then I'll have to stop there. Okay, so let's talk about how you would actually do this experiment, detect neutrinos. So first of all, you need a source of neutrinos that you can control. And uh, yeah, a nuclear weapon is pretty good. A lot of neutrinos coming out from that. The only thing is that it's a little scary. Um, and now there were some serious proposals to build a laboratory underground and then build, you know, blow up nuclear weapons above. And the, uh, the way the thing would work is you would have your, your little, like a mini laboratory in this big pipe. The instant before the weapon goes off, the, there's like a thing that releases it, and it's falling down this well, and the weapon goes off. Oh, hell breaks loose, you know, there's like an earthquake, and your experiment lands on a bed of feathers or foam or whatever at the bottom, and then you get your data out. Not the most practical scheme, uh, in my opinion. <laughs> um, okay, a much more uh, straightforward thing is to use neutrinos from a nuclear reactor. I, this is a picture of a nuclear reactor being refueled. And, um, and so, so that's what they did. The nuclear reactors are pretty good because you can switch them on and off. So you build an experiment, see if you get neutrinos. Oh, I see a neutrino. And then 
you turn off the nuclear reactor, and hopefully you don't see neutrinos then. And then you turn the reactor back on. Oh, we do see neutrinos. So if you see that, right, you, you can pretty much declare victory. Um, okay, so what's, why do neutrinos come out of nuclear reactors? Well, you get a lot of neutrons being made, and the neutrons decay into a proton and an electron and an antineutrino. Uh, and, uh, let's, and, okay, this is wrong. This is not called, in, the inverse beta decay is going to happen later on. Okay. Can you scratch that out? Inverse beta decay part is, is wrong. Um, okay, but we're going to get we're going to get a lot of anti neutrinos coming out of a nuclear reactor. Can I ask another question? Yeah. Does nature just determine the nature of the neutrinos that are I don't, I don't know that, uh, the answer to that. All I can say is that it's like, it's like conservation of charge. If you have a reaction that makes something positive, then somewhere you've got to have something negative come out. And, and so, same idea. If you have a reaction that makes something with a lepton number of plus one, somewhere in your system, you've got to come out with a lepton number of negative one to balance it out. It's the same idea. In nature is doing it somehow. Yep. Um, yeah, and oh, by the way, we can check our the charge and the baryon number and the lepton numbers uh, conserved in here. The baryon number of the neutron is, according to your piece of paper, is what? Zero. Neutron? Oh, one. One. The, the, the charge is zero. Yeah. The baryon number is one. The proton's baryon number is also one. one. Yeah. Uh, now getting to the charge. The neutron is zero, the proton is plus one, and the electron is negative one. Okay, so they're going to cancel out. So the charge is balanced. And um, the lepton numbers. The neutron has a lepton number of zero. The proton is also zero, so so far we're okay. The Electron has a lepton number of one. So, okay, so now we need to balance that out. And so the antineutrino has negative one in the lepton number. So, so they, they do cancel out and the equation is balanced. I have a question. So, what is the baryon for the lepton? Zero. The baryon number for an electron is a zero. And again, so there's a bunch of zeros there. So I, that, that's a good question right there. That means you're thinking. You're ready to do some nuclear physics. <laughs> All right. Uh, now, this picture here, um, this is the team that finally actually detected the, uh, the neutrino. They called it Project Poltergeist. And uh, here's my boss when he was a lot younger. His name was Frank Rhinus eventually got the Nobel Prize for discovering the neutrino. And when I got my job at UC Irvine, he was already retired. But he was still a, a tough boss, even when he was retired. And Cohen, um, he would have gotten the Nobel Prize with Linus, except unfortunately he died a little too soon. So. Okay, so, so here we are, this is the team, and they set up a large uh, detector underground underneath a, uh, well, they first tried it under a huge nuclear reactor in Washington, and then another huge reactor in uh, South Carolina. And uh, so they were looking for um, this reaction, right? So this is what's making the antineutrinos. This is how you detect the antineutrinos. And this is the thing that I should have labeled reverse, um, inverse beta decay. So you've got uh, an antineutrino interacting with a proton that changes 
the proton into a neutron and a, uh, a, a anti-electron or a positron. And uh, notice that the lepton numbers do balance out. What's the lepton number of the antineutrino? Negative one. What's the lepton number of the anti-electron? Negative one also. There you go. And the baryon numbers balance the charge balance rate. The charge is plus one. Charge is plus one. So the charges are balancing. Are balancing. The only thing that looks peculiar about this is that the right hand side, you would think, has more energy than the left side. But that's all because the neutrino actually has some, it's bringing in some energy. So I didn't, I should have added that, said that, you know, it would make the, the formula look messy, but there's energy in that neutrino, and that balances the energy on the left and right side of the equation. So they are looking for this. Now, you, they don't actually see this directly, but what they do see is the positron meeting up with an electron, and immediately you get two gamma rays, and the two gamma rays uh, have exactly the same energy, getting to your point. They go in opposite directions, and uh, they're very easy to, uh, to pick up um, because of that, 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 those properties. They're going in opposite directions, and they have exactly 0.511 MeV of, of energy. What's 0.511 MeV? The, that's the mass of the electron. So the gamma rays get that mass. That's in the form of energy. Yeah. This is uh, these are drawings by Rhinus and Cohen. Um, you you know this is sort of an overview. Uh, you've got the neutrino comes in. It uh, it interacts and makes. Uh, the positron, the positron sends two gamma rays. These are photosensing areas, so they pick up the, the, the light uh, from the gamma. Well, they, the, the gamma rays make a flash of light, and then the, the flash of light gets picked up, um, and, and the two is you know, above and below, so that's pretty, pretty, uh, pretty unique. And then uh, something else happens. If I Something else happens. You see, besides the positron that came up, you get a neutron that also comes out. And that neutron does something here, right? It meets up with some a cadmium uh, nucleus. And the cadmium nucleus gloms onto the neutron. And that's. Um, that uh, excites, that process excites the uh, cadmium nucleus to a higher energy state, and you get, uh, when it, then it de-excites, and it uh, sends out a bunch of gamma rays, which you can then see. And so this experiment, even though you had noise from cosmic rays coming down as yet another subject, this, this is a very difficult experiment because you have lots of sources of interference, mainly cosmic rays. Even though you had all this interference, the fact that you were looking for two back-to-back -back gamma rays followed a few microseconds later by the gamma rays from the cadmium capturing the neutron, that combination made it a uh, kind of a, a foolproof signal. If you saw that, you had you had your neutrino. And uh, yeah, so that that's what I'm saying right here, that's the cadmium capturing the, the, the neutron. And, uh, and so there you go. They got it. They would get a few neutrino captures per day. They'd run this experiment for weeks and weeks. And after a while, they came out and they said, we did it. We got our neutrinos. And so that was it. They, they, uh, it was a big deal. Uh, Fermi was excited. Pauli was excited. All, all these people were patting themselves on the back. Yay, we got it right. So, um, so that's kind of the story of the discovery of neutrinos. I apologize. I, you know, I have all this other stuff that you know. That I can come back again.
we can do another lecture and we can talk about the videos from the sun and so on. Yeah. So, okay. And that'll be next time. All right. Well, thank you. that um, it, it's, it's full of protons, and so uh, you can kind of calculate what the probability is of the neutrino interacting with the proton, and... Um, is it going to be a liquid? Can it be two things? Neutrinos can pass through solid objects. Well, money is a, is a big factor here, because um, let's say you want to build a detector that has uh, um, 30,000 tons. 30,000 tons of plastic mm. is going to be prohibitive, right? You're never gonna be able to do it. So um, this 30,000 tons of pure water is, even that's expensive, but it doesn't break the bank. Yeah. If water is a pretty good target, the protons are, are a decent neutrino target. Is that why they're building them in the oceans? Um, yeah, so once again, it's, it, that's a cost thing, right? The ocean is free, more or less. And um, you, so these detectors have to be located away from the cosmic rays that are raining down on us from space. See, the problem with cosmic rays is that they are so high energy, that the protons have so much energy and when they slam into the upper atmosphere, they make all of these secondary particles, including pions. The pions, which we haven't talked about, decay into muons and neutrinos. Or, at the same time, some pions may decay into electrons and neutrinos. And so now you've got, coming down on top of us, we've got the the muons, which mess up the experiment right away, and um, so that's a good reason for putting your experiment underground. Um, but also you have these neutrinos that are coming down, and those are impossible to get rid of, right? Those neutrinos you're just gonna have to live with. Hmm. Yeah. Um, now getting to the ocean thing, at least being way, way, way down at the bottom of the ocean, you're gonna be getting away from the muons that are raining down. That's, that's hard to do because muons are very penetrating. They, they can go down you know, hundreds of meters. So you need to be thousands of meters down to really get away from the muons. Yeah. Um, so I know that obviously you can't really be I have a picture to show you. Uh, there. That's a picture of the sun, not taken with light. It was taken with neutrinos. It's a little blurry, but but that's it. Yeah. So that's maybe not exactly what you were asking about, but but it, it, when you ask that question, it's just like, what was your question again? <laughs> Um, well, I saw like the very first version of this picture about 40 years ago when I was a student. It was more blurry. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Not as good as that. Um, um, but you know, as you know, this Super Kamiya Kande is running 24/7, and uh, the, lo the longer it runs, the, the better the data is. And with this sort of experiment, having a lot of data is good because you can refine the you can refine your picture using statistical processes. So. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, oh, okay. Yeah. 
I think she was referring to what one neutrino would look like. Like, you know what I mean? Like, what one would look like? Just one. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I don't, I, I can't picture a way to do that. Right. That we we only see or quote unquote see neutrinos once they've touched something, and uh, so when they're in flight, then uh, then yeah, they, I I, don't, I can't picture a, an experiment to do that. Yeah, the um, so how we use water to help detect neutrinos? Can we use them for taking ice sheet to help detect the neutrinos or not? So there is a. Uh, there is a big experiment uh, underway at the South Pole where they're using the ice sheet over the South Pole as the target for neutrinos. And um, I'm trying to remember the name of the experiment. Oh, it's called Ice Cube. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, I'll talk about that next time. <laughs> Thank you for inviting me. I, I really enjoyed giving this talk, and I really enjoyed uh, preparing for this talk. I, yeah. It was an education for me. So, okay. Thank you. Part two soon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to know. <laughs>